Hello, everyone. Hopefully you all are having a great week so far. It's me, Andrew. I'm here in my home in lovely Ligonier, Pennsylvania. Um, I was going to head over to the cottage, but then I got a little bit delayed with some online meetings that I was in. So I unfortunately couldn't go over there. So I was like, what am I going to do really fast and kind of put together a project? Because I was going to do something else. Um, and I figured since uh, it's going to be Easter this weekend, I think it's this weekend, it's coming up. Um, I don't really celebrate Easter. I haven't for a, a, a long while. However, I love rabbits and I love eggs and I love all kinds of fun stuff like that. So I said, you know, might as well, let, let's do this. So um, I haven't done a, a tutorial on working with polymer clay for a while. Um, and I was thinking about ways that I could kind of make things a little bit more accessible. I know that sometimes when you're starting a new, um, a new kind of technique or a new type of, uh, a new product, you want to get everything. And sometimes that can be very daunting and it can kind of, you know, I don't know, create feelings of insecurity if you can't get everything or, you know, it's just, it can be overwhelming. And there's a lot of, um, of things like tutorials and stuff out there that say that you need a lot of, like, you need this this thousand dollar rolling machine and you need this and this and this and then it something that starts off as relatively accessible and fun becomes kind of a headache so i thought why not do something where um you know where folks can can still have fun but not have to spend a lot of money so um uh, as as a lot of you know already because i've shared this kind of you know, openly, me and William, we didn't grow up very with much money. So when I wanted to do something, especially crafty, I had to think about ways of doing it kind of on a budget. So I thought this would be a good way to kind of do that, go back to my roots. Um, I've been working with polymer clay since I was a very small child um, and um, used to make stuff for different galleries and shops and um Eventually, I got kind of where I couldn't keep up with that. So, um, yeah. So, and I also, I feel like I my interests, um, they uh, ebb and flow. I don't know if you're like that. Um, but for me, I know that, like, I've never found the, like, one thing that I was just like, I'm just going to do this for the rest of my life. I've... Um, uh, I've always kind of been wanting to try new things and experiment and explore different avenues of how to do things. And I feel like it makes me a more um, empowered artist because there are, once you understand different materials, there's no limits, right? If you, you're like, how do you do this? Um, then you know. So, or you can figure it out and you have the tools to figure that out. And it may not be something that's like a direct correlation to what you're actually doing, but kind of uh, can come from a different perspective. So I think that's really important uh, for me and my practice. Now, if you have a different one, you know, that's you and, um, you know, that's up to you how you do that. Um, so let's see. I've got a couple people watching. Cheryl's watching. Hi, Cheryl. Jen is watching. Hey, Jen. Marianne's watching. Hey, Marianne. Now I'm not streaming to you um, to Instagram because I don't really know how to put that up. And William is at his ceramics class. Um, speaking of that, William uh, is in his ceramics class, and they've been talking about this show on H. Well, it was on HBO, and it's called The Great Pottery Throwdown. But it's a UK show. It's kind of like Great British Bake Off. Great British Bake Off? Is that how, you, how it is? Anyway, so um, they've been watch we've been watching that because um, he's been talking with about it with some of his classmates. And he found it online. And so um, it kind of got me in the mood to play with clay. Um, 
they were doing some bass relief, which is low relief sculpture. Um, so uh, they were doing birds. And I thought, well, let's, you know, it got me in the mood to sculpt. So um, I thought today would be a fun day to do that. Um, I've shared some of my polymer clay techniques before, um, particularly about building armatures and things in the past, but it's been a while and some of you all are, are relatively new. Um, I don't really do polymer clay as much as I used to. I used to do polymer clay every day, all day for several years. Um, and now I kind of break it out when I need it. Um, but I love it. And polymer clay is a really uh, amazing material because it's kind of like the chameleon of the art world um, in the sense that it can look almost like anything. You can make it look like metal. You can make it look like stone. You can make it even look like glass. So I think it's a really wonderful um, medium. And it's something that I think people... Uh, you know, it's relatively accessible. You can, if you have a big box store or even heck Walmart, you can go there and um, get polymer clay and it's really relatively inexpensive, um, you know, comparatively to like, if you're like, oh, I'm gonna do PMC, that's like a hundred dollars for 45 grams. I can't think of it now, but so that's not always accessible in my mind. So this one you can pick up, um, you know, cruise around the clearance section. Sometimes you can pick up a block of polymer clay for like 50 cents. Um, so, you know, and as with everything, you can, once you have like the basic skills down, you don't need a lot of tools or stuff like that, but you can always add more. So you know, once you get kind of going, there are different hacks that you can get to make your life a lot easier. For instance, um, I hate conditioning polymer clay. I hate conditioning most kinds of clay bodies. Um, my hands hurt a lot, so it does kind of, um, it, it, uh, sometimes, especially if I work on it a lot, it can kind of make my hands hurt. So I don't particularly love that. So I've, um, eventually gotten a pasta maker um, or a pasta roller and that has helped tremendously and you can condition a ton more clay faster than you can do um, with uh, with just your hands however you don't necessarily need it um, it does make your life easier so there's things like that where um, the more more tools you get the easier certain jobs can be However, you don't necessarily need those things. All right, we've reached the point in our little talk talk where um, uh, William has told me that I need to tell people to like and share our posts and that will be a good thing to do. All right, so it does help. So if you or people you know are interested in uh, creativity and crafting and all kinds of stuff like that, um, share the video. Um, we would appreciate that greatly. Um, there's a couple things that we've been, we've got going on. Um, last night we had the African um, item sale. I was, I was about to say the African bead sale, but we had all kinds of stuff. Um, we had African beads, we had trade beads, we had little coin purses, um, we had some finished jewelry, all kinds of lovely things. If you missed that, check it out. Um, they, some of those things were a little bit more of collector items. So um, we broke up some strands, some uh, bigger strands to hopefully make it more accessible for folks. Um, if you're interested in checking those out and finding maybe some goodies for your collection, uh, you can definitely do so. Um, you can either uh, scroll back through the videos on YouTube. On Facebook, It's a, um, there is um, a, uh, a drop-down tab where you can see our past lives, I think making stuff up y'all um but they are they do exist and you can watch the replays and um hopefully find some goodies there 
there were a lot of things left over. So there is a potential for getting that. Um, we also did, um, what else did we do? Um, we shared some of my artwork that I recently kind of made. Um, we had a misprint of some prints that of my noble creature drawings that I made um, when William was uh, having some, when he was first having heart problems, I started this uh, series, the noble creature series, because I could kind of take it with me. And when he was in his appointments and stuff, I was hanging out in the, the waiting room, I could draw and keep busy and like, when I went down to see my family when my dad was sick, um, I could take it on the plane and um, work on the plane. So I had something to occupy me. I think sometimes um, when you're facing hardships, if you just like, I don't know, I feel like if I keep busy and I'm making stuff, um, it doesn't really like you don't get like thunderstruck. If you, you know, sometimes things are hard. Life is hard. And so sometimes if you're busy and you're making things, you can kind of focus your energy into that. And even though you're processing some kind of hard feelings and stuff, you can channel that energy and turn it into something good. So that's kind of my, my philosophy. Keep busy, keep making, um, and, you know, eventually you can overcome things. So I um, got that mis those misprints, and the prints were perfectly fine. They just weren't the right size that we needed for the sleeves that we had. So I cut out um, those, and I used those in some collages. So um, if you didn't know, I went to the School of Visual Arts in New York City, and I got my degree in fine arts, and mostly I specialized in collage and mixed media. And I know how many of you all know that, but that's kind of my early kind of, not early, because that's kind of like, you know, as an adult at that point. But um, uh, that's where I got kind of the basis of my higher education in uh, over there. But I also have been really fortunate and been taking lots of classes and doing lots of things. And um, yeah, picked up some skills doing that way, doing it that way. Um, so anyways, uh, we, William debuted those, um, Noble Creature Redux collection. Um, there's two, kind of two versions of that. One version is with the monoprints in the backgrounds, and then the next version is with collages in the backgrounds. Um, and I think that's probably all the ones that I'm going to make for now. I do have a stack of prints that are still not the right size. So who knows what will happen with that, those. But I don't like to throw stuff away if they're still, like, good. You know, I don't like to waste stuff. So um, I try not to waste things. So that's where um, we're coming at it from that. So I was like, you know, I like these. And also I've been experimenting with some, some different pieces that I'm working on for a potential show. And uh, they, it's all about kind of like merging the different techniques that I use, at least with my process. I feel like it's really important for me to revisit and grow from the things that I've done and build on those things. And sometimes it's not a straight line. I kind of think of it more like a curly cue in the sense that I keep going back to things and coming around, maybe like a rick a rack What's that, brick a brack You know, that, that kind of trim that goes around and around and around. Um, so it's kind of going linear, linearly, linear, linear, linearly. It goes kind of linear, it goes in that straight line-ish kind of way, but it curls back on itself. So anyways, um, uh, yeah, so uh, those are on the online store. Um, William also added the new Fresh Start mug and Fresh Start tumbler, which I think are really cool. I'm really, I really like them. I think they turned out really well. Marion says Rick Rack. It's Rick Rack with Brick a Brack. Or I don't know. 
a lot of those words kind of sound the same to me. Um, it, or does that mean like brick of brock, like clutter? I don't know. Anyway, so um, those are on the online store. If you go to allegorygallery.com, you can find the tumblers, the mugs, the noble creature redux, and some of the originals. So you can find that. I mean, it says bric a brac as little statues, etc. Okay, so like tchotchkes. Like, I'm going to go, and there are bric a brac all over the place. Um, well, okay. Um, and then I showed. Uh, they're also from that collection. There are these little dye sublimation pendants. You can get ones with the holes, without the holes, which makes it kind of a, like a cabochon. And there's also a kit. And I have been uh, researching, researching, and by that I mean remaking, remaking, and remaking it. So I find finally found out the perfect way of creating the capture with the beads. So I'll show you that maybe tomorrow because William and Jen are filming at the cottage tomorrow. So I'm going to be flying solo again. Um, and speaking of filming, uh, they're filming the next Saturday morning tutorial on YouTube. Um, and if you didn't see last week's, that was a really good one. Um, they're all pretty good in my opinion, but, um, so that was another herringbone wire kind of project. And then before that, what was the one before that? Um, I can't remember, but anyways, if you go to YouTube, um, I, I think how many is it? 41. So this will be the 42nd video. Pretty wild. I, to think about that, um, you know, that's a lot. And that's a, it's a really wonderful thing that we're able to do that and share that. Um, Jen's a really talented artist and I appreciate, um, I feel really lucky to be surrounded by so many, um, so many lovely people who are creative. Um, even though we live in this tiny little town, I think it's we're very lucky to have so many creative people around us. Um, and so, anyways, check those out. Um, it, those are really fun. Those should It should debut on Saturday morning. I always say, you know, should because, um, you know, technology. The last one, William got done early. And for some reason, it took, I don't know, an incredibly long time to upload and maybe there was like an outage or shortage. I don't know any of that behind the scenes stuff um, there. But um, yeah, so uh, I think I'm caught up on all the stuff that I have to talk about. Um, if you didn't, well, maybe one more thing. So last night we did the African beads and then I did um, an AG live challenge where I had uh, requested that folks post in our design challenge group um, uh, something that they made using African beads. The first kind of throwdown challenge was to post something that they use um, that had green in it. And then the second one was African bees. I think they're kind of fun, you know? And you don't necessarily have to post new stuff. Um, so if you, you know, I know a lot of people don't have a ton of time. So for, to like do throwdown challenges is not always possible. Um, but, um, you know, if you made something in the past, you can always share something that you made in the past because, you know, um, like I said, we're, we go back on ourselves and that way we don't, um, you know, we can revisit the things that we used to do. And it, that's not bad. Um, I think it's super helpful to, to do that. So maybe I've been thinking about this. Um, and I was like, maybe I'll have them do something with rabbits. And then I was like, that's kind of specific. Like, if you don't have a rabbit already, 
the the chance of you making something with a rabbit is like slim. So let's do something with pastels. So the tonight's um, hashtag. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, we need to go through and clean up some of these banners because we have so many banners. And then um, some of them were like for a one time only thing. And now, okay, here at the bottom. So tonight's hashtag AG live challenge is to use pastels in a project. So use pastels in a project. And then you can post your projects in the on Facebook that's um, at the allegory gallery design challenge group all right so here's the address of the at the bottom of here as the address of the Facebook group and then just put the hashtag on it so that we know that it's for that. Um, you don't have to do this. I mean, you don't have to do anything really. But um, if you want to play along, I think it's fun. You know, why not? I think it also, um, uh, if you are doing them like on the fly, like you're just going to do like do them as they come out, um, you know, you can. Uh, uh, you have to think about that strategically, right? So you, if you're if your plan is to do them every night or so, or whenever we do a challenge, then you may not want to make like a great big something or another because you won't have time. Um, at least in my book, you won't have time. So maybe you just make a little simple pair of earrings or a keychain or something, um, or a quick necklace or a quick bracelet, something simple. You don't have to get too elaborate um, and don't overthink it is what I would say. Because I know sometimes, and I'm guilty of this myself, is that we can get stuck in our own heads and we can kind of like, oh, well, what if I did this? What if I did this? If I, did, if I only had this thing, then, you know, and sometimes that's like the hardest part. So part of these challenges are to help folks kind of um, embrace uh, you know, working with, you know, things that they have and not getting caught up in the what ifs or the worry or the anxiety. Um, there is, I'm reading a book or I just finished a book called, um, His Majesty's Dragon, which is by Naomi no Novik. And, um, in one of the parts they're like, don't borrow tomorrow's trouble. Um, and it's kind of, I thought it was a good kind of quote, and I could be messing that up, but it was a good quote in that, um, you know, sometimes in this moment, in this time, we don't have like anything like deeply pressing, but tomorrow maybe there's something, um, you know, that's hard or difficult to come. And a part of that is um, you can't really do anything necessarily if you get paralyzed by worry. So that's something I've been working on is trying not to worry as much, try to go with the flow more and just do the things that I can do. Um, Marianne says, I think I might skip pastels, but we'll see. I know you have some pastel beads because you have that painted desert. Um, so there are some, you know, lavender shades and some dusty pinks and some, some tans. Um, Jen says, no pastels. I don't know. I, I think, I think if you, if something is like something, sometimes this is another thing that I'll sometimes do. If something, if I find I don't like something or there's something that, um, that I don't particularly gravitate towards. Like for the longest time, I did not like pink either. I don't know if y'all know this or not, but I was like, I don't like pink. I don't like pink. Um, and then I used, I got um, different beads and stuff that were pink 
and I kind of created challenges for myself. And now I love it. Um, it's so weird how that happens. Like um, when you work with sometimes when you examine certain things and think about why you don't like certain thing, um, uh, then it kind of reveals things. Like somebody said that they're like afraid of clowns. I'm like, why are they afraid of clowns? And then, so, um, you know, you can go back and explore that and you can grow as an artist, I think. Or not, you know, it's up to you. This is just suggestions. I'm not a doctor. Um, Marion says, I have enjoyed the challenges. And Cheryl says, hashtag AG live challenge accepted. Oh, good. Um, and then Cheryl says peach would work. Yeah, peach fuzz is technically uh, passed out. Also, we're keeping these relatively vague um, so that you so that we can learn about how you interpret the challenges. Because I think sometimes when there's too many limits, like you can only use this, 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 and this, and this, and this, and this, and um, only this, and this, and this, then, um, you know, that's cool too. That's one way of doing it. But I also think it is something where um, by leaving it open-ended, we get to see, like, how you're thinking, like, how you're going to approach this challenge. So I think that's always interesting to leave it kind of open-ended so that you're not, like, you're not closed into uh, so specific. Like, um, you know, I can, I, I like to see when people can duplicate things and can master making a project that somebody else has designed for years and years. That's why I did. You know, I worked as a freelance uh, designer to make projects for other people to make. Um, so I get that. But I also like to see what where your creativity is, like what interests you? How do you think? What is something that makes you excited? So if you hate pastel, maybe some make a, you know, a red slash through a bunch of pastel beads. I don't know. Um, you know, it's and it's it's up to you how you interpret these challenges. And, you know, the word pastel, maybe that's the word, you know, I don't know. Um, so use your creativity and don't overthink it too much. But, um, you know, I think these are a fun way to get to know yourself and your, your kind of style. Um, Jennifer says, I make salmon items. So there you go. That's kind of, uh, that's kind of uh, pastel-y. She says, everyone should be afraid of clowns. Do not trust them. I don't know. I follow some some Cirque du Soleil people on the internet, on um, Instagram, and they're like so cool. I think that would be like, if I was like more, I don't know. It's never too late, I guess. However, I wake up tired and stiff, so I don't know how, uh, how um, I'm not gonna be up on the balance beam doing flips and stuff, but you know, I think it's interesting. Um, Tina says, I always associate pastels with ugly pink and blue landscapes, but my sister does gorgeous meadow scenes with normal colors that are pastels. Um, yeah, I think that's an interesting way of phrasing things. Um, and this is something that I've kind of been thinking about a lot, um, and that it's the term ugly. And it's so interesting because it's something that's so very subjective. Um, and you can take something that is considered uh, to be revered and like the highest form of beauty in one culture, and then you can put it into a different, um, uh, different arena, and then all of a sudden it's ugly. And I think one of the things, like I think about this like a lot because I think about aesthetics and it's the way of things, how they look and how they like feel and um, come across and that kind of the understanding of relationships of the visual. 
and how they may delight or repulse. And um, so I think it's one of those things where when I think about the word ugly, it has so many different like layered connotations. So I don't know. I think when maybe we'll do a make something that you find ugly or something, make an ugly piece. Because there is a whole, like in painting, there's a whole genre of ugly paintings. And they're specifically made to kind of break the rules of composition and colors. Um, and they're purposely designed to not look beautiful. However, by doing that, then they become these really beautiful pieces. So I think it's interesting, but today's challenge is pastels. So if you're interested, you can post your creations in the Allegory Gallery Design Challenge Group and hashtag it with the AG Live Challenge. All right, Harry's watching. Hey, Harry. Um, Marion says, I just wouldn't use pastel pink in something for myself. Um, that's another thing, like considering where this piece goes and who it's for, or what does it mean? Like, is it for yourself or is it for somebody else? It's interesting also to think about things like that. And Jennifer, Jen says, the only pink I'm in love with is tourmaline. Oh, I love, you know, I love, there's so many different shades of pink. And I'm in it to win it. My favorite are the magenta-based pinks. Um, they have such a, like, a, it zings to me. Like, you know how some colors, they can kind of, like, feel, like, mellow? But some colors, like, there's certain types of, like, electric blues and stuff that just, like, zing to me. Um, and sometimes I like to put a little bit of that into my work and um, play around with that. But that's me. You know, everybody is different. Um, Jen says, making projects for other people to copy is tough. LOL. I still don't know what I'm going to do this for this week's tutorial. Um, yeah, I think that that's one of those things that it's challenging. I mean, I used to write for books and magazines and um, for me, it was a little bit easier because I had, generally speaking, they would give me like a style guide and they would say, okay, we're going to focus on using, you know, pastels. So I knew that I was going to make something that had to incorporate pastel beads. Um, sometimes they would give me a sponsor list. So they would say, oh, here are our main sponsors. And then... Um, you know, I didn't have to use stuff that was from the sponsors. However, it is, you know, they had to sell advertising and keep their advertisers happy. So generally speaking, if I use stuff from the sponsors, it was more, more likely to get picked up. Um, and so, you know, it wasn't as hard as some when, you know, and you can do anything. I think that when you have it can be very liberating when you have complete freedom, but it can also be sometimes paralyzing when you're like, what am I going to do? And then like, for me, I get, when I was, when I do these tutorials, I'm like, did I already show that? And I realized that um, generally speaking, we have um, a combined following of over 10,000 people. Like if you break it down, how many followers I have, how many followers William has, how many followers are at the store, on Facebook, on YouTube, on that. There's a um, there's over 10,000 people who are part of our community. Um, and, you know, for these lives, maybe 10 people will watch live, maybe 20 people. Sometimes when we get up higher, it's 30, 40. Um, so if you think about that, that's not even 1% of our total following that sees these videos. So in my mind, if I show something um, that I've done before, you know, I'll try to make it a little bit different, but um, we're talking about something new. 
but also um, the chances that somebody's seen all of the things that I've done and they've done it and they're not going to be interested by it is very small. So that's something that I kind of had to get over. We do a lot of business coaching where we, we, we uh, have different uh, people who are experts in social media and we take their, their workshops and classes and stuff like that. And one of them was to uh, keep things simple, keep it simple. And so a lot of times I go, I get where I get like super fixated on having to do like something that's like super complicated or you can't find the information somewhere else or, you know, there are things that are, um, you know, highly specialized and those are good too. But also there's sometimes people who are just starting out and they want to know how to do very simple things or they're trying a new material and they haven't tried it before. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different options, but I know that it can sometimes be overwhelming. Um, um, all right. Um, Jen says, I'm working from my own stock and some things are vintage and may not be available to everyone. So, yeah. Well, if you do need the hookup, you know where to find us. Um, got a whole big room full of stuff. All right. So what we're going to do is I'm going to flip this around because um, and we're going to get going. All right. So we're going to do a little bit of sculpture today. And this is a uh, technique um, is bass relief. Now, the sculptural practice that I do is both additive and subtractive. Um, sometimes when you're learning sculpture, there are people who only do additive work. And then there's people who do where they take like a big lump of clay and then they carve it away. And that's subtractive. Where there are other people who will build things up and kind of add to it. So I kind of do both. And I'm also going to focus on using tools that are um, that are either free or inexpensive. All right. So let's flip this around and then we'll get started. All right, so let's put this. Okay, so um, we're gonna make a rabbit. Now, um, this is not, um, this is something, an image I found off of the internet. Um, this is like, you can buy this and use this as licensable. So I'm not going to use this in anything because I don't want to violate the um, copyright that the owner of this license have. However, I am going to use it for my own way um, of just looking at it. And I'm not going to try to duplicate it exactly, um, but also I want to be able to, you know, there, um, especially when you're working um, in fantasy, and different things like that, and doing things like a whimsical style, um, the things that are going to root it in reality are the details. So there are certain things like if you there's if you want, you can be as whimsical and fantastical as you want, but there are certain things that are going to like instantly make you know what it is, right? So like ears, for example, on this rabbit are what we, you know, if you take the ears away, it could be, you know, it could be a uh, capybara or whatever. Um, so it's important to look at the things. And so if you have very prominent features, um, sometimes if you exaggerate those things a little bit, 
um, it can help sell what you're trying to put out there. And by sell it, I mean make it more convincing and more recognizable as a form language. So that's an important thing. Like, you know, sometimes if you're going to make like a crow or a raven or whatever, you're going to exaggerate the beaks. And then that way people, when they see it, they instantly know what it is. Like, you know, when there's caricatures of people, you know how sometimes people set up on the sidewalk or whatever, and they draw pictures. Generally speaking, the things that they're they're picking up on are, um, like when we look at a person, most people look relatively the same. And I hate to say that, but, um, you know, most people, two eyes, two ears, you know, uh, and a face, right? But it's the details that make them, you know, make them recognizable. So if somebody has, for instance, like me, I have a shaved head. So instantly, if you have a shaved head, then, you know, you can tell me apart from William, who has hair. Um, or if somebody has really um, large ears, if you exaggerate the ears a little bit more. Now, not to be like too comical, because then that can, you know, you're, you're walking the, the thin line of, of being offensive, but, um, you know, if you just uh, make those ears slightly larger, then, um, then, you know, that becomes a more recognizable form language, all right? So that's something to, to think about. Now, when we get into the sculpture of this, we're going to talk a little bit about drawing practices. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with drawing, um, or, or if you have a background in drawing. So this may be repetitive, um, but if you don't, then this may be a learning opportunity. Um, you work from the general to the specific. Now, what I mean by that is sometimes when you look at like an image like this, it can be overwhelming because then you start picking up on all those details. Like you start looking at the glint of the of the rabbit's eye and you start doing stuff like that and you start nitpicking it and it's a lot of visual information and sometimes it's hard to kind of coalesce that with the actual application of making it so what i'm talking about is go from the general to the specific and i find that that works with most things most problems it's like a problem solving like you it's like if you if you see there's water dripping from your car, you know the problem is there's uh, a fluid dripping from your pro your car. So you look at your car, you go to the place where it seems to be coming from, and you go more specific until you find the leak, right? So for this, if the shape, if this is the overall shape, then you know you're going to have this kind of potato-like shape, you're going to have this round shape, and you're going to have this round shape, and you're gonna have this. And then from there, you can build in the details, right? So you can start off, this is kind of like, if you really wanna cut it, if you, um, I worked with an artist named Elena Sisto, and um, one of the things she did, she says, start with your highest point of your, your drawing, all right? And then start with your lowest point of your drawing, all right? And then you you plot these points out. So then if you are, your widest point is here and then your other widest point is here, then you can kind of create what looks almost like these weird kind of coffin shapes. And then from that, then you know that it's a way of training your eye to see. If you know that from here to here, this is the line, it's kind of midway, then you know that you can kind of cut this away and this mark will be kind of midway in between this this kind of line vector, all right? So um, that's something that you can do to train your eye to see. And then once you do that, you kind of start reducing that form down. So you take away like the background information or this like kind of other 
more background information, and then think about these things. Like then you can start thinking about like highlights and shadows. And when you're talking about sculpture, generally when you see a highlight um, and it's a non-shiny material, even if it is shiny, generally that is higher up. So for instance, this is higher than this is. And the shade is real subtle, but you can tell this is slightly whiter than this. So this recesses and this goes and comes forward. All right. So that's kind of like a basic one-on-one -on -one or basic tutorial on like how you can uh, better sculpt from an image or something you see. Now, the, you can also use this in three-dimensional space. So that's something that you can do. Like you can look at a chair. Sometimes it's hard. Um, I know like with perspective drawings and stuff like that, it can be sometimes hard because there's very specific lines to create that illusion of space, all right? So for us, what we're doing, we are going to observe things and then break it down from its most basic forms and then go into deep dive into detail, okay? So also, when you're working with this, don't be so precious because your fingers are going to ruin whatever you are working on right away, all right? So I have seen where people will get a, hump of, a lump of clay and then they start making the fur texture before they've resolved their overall composition. And I'm like, well, I guess if you'd like to do the work twice, there you go. But the thing is, is that when you have that fur texture, that's one of the last things that you're going to do, all right? So the tools that we're gonna be using today, I've got this very, very specialized, um, hard to find, no, it's a Shusko Bob skewer. So very inexpensive. Um, you can find this at like the dollar store if you don't have this already. Order some Shushka Bobs, maybe there you go. So this is just wood. I've also got, um, what's that called? Not a tongue depressor. Lollipop stick, not lollipop. Popsicle stick, popsicle stick. I've got this popsicle stick. Now also, these are both wood which they mean, which, you know, means that you can manipulate these. So if you need a particular um, line width, you can carve this down and um, use that um, to have whatever shape or texture you need. If you need this to be rougher, you can scratch it up with some heavy grit sandpaper and do it that way. If you need something to be smoother, Get the sandpaper, the real fine sandpaper out, smooth it down, polish it up, and you can get really smooth texture. Sometimes I see, you know, there, pardon me, there are certain things um, for like sculpture tools um, where it does help if sometimes like, if you need like a harder line, if you use steel or metal and you have like a blade, like a tissue blade, if you need something real precise like that, then use that because that will, it's a harder material, so you'll get harder lines. Um, if you don't really care about that, then these will work. With cane work, it's essential that you have a tissue blade. If you don't have a tissue blade, then it's going to be, it's not going to be as thin and as precise as it could be. So that, you know, that's something to think about. Now, the other kind of tool that I'm going to work with is the subway tile. Now, as you can see, this is a used subway tile. I, um, that I use this for my sculpture. This is great because you can transport it around and pick things up without touching them. And also, you can put this in the oven and bake it, um, and it will, you know, it will survive that. And so it's portable, and you can pick it up. And also, um, in theory, it can make an, a more even um, heating kind of from, so you don't end up with like a cold spot. Um, and that's a little bit of a, 
you know, you have there. That's more of a specialized. Like, I could go deep dive about like ovens and how that some places are more um, cold in your oven and some places are hotter in your oven. And so, in theory, the the ceramic tile kind of evens out that heat. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about baking in a little bit, but um, right now we're going to dive into the polymer clay. Now, this is, you're going to be like, what's that color? Um, and it's a mixture of different colors, and it really doesn't matter what color this is. Now, sometimes it's helpful if you only want to do the clay and you're not going to do anything to the clay and you want to have your clay be the thing that you have the, as a color, you know, that's one way that you can do this. For me, I'm going to go back and paint this sculpture, this bass relief sculpture. So um, it doesn't matter what color the clay is. Now for me, I mix a ratio of one to one of um, super sculpty and, um, uh, Primo. And so I mix, that's my ratio that I like to sculpt with. It's one to one. Now, one of the nice things about that is that since they're generally speaking, Super Sculpey is like a beige color, um, you can take that and you mix it with a different color, maybe white if you want it to be white. If you want it to be whatever color, you can use that. And um, that goes into what I'm gonna we're gonna be talking about next is called conditioning. Now, one of the reasons why it's nice that there are two different colors is because if you work the clay and you get it to be one uniform color, then you know that the clay has been thoroughly conditioned. Generally speaking, what that means is the emulsifiers you want to redistribute them, and so that it kind of reactivates that plasticizer and makes it nice and um, not going to crack and have problems um, and you get a nice kind of uh, you can get um, you can kind of pull it so this isn't conditioned as well as it could be but generally speaking you want it to have a little bit of um, that kind of uh, plasticizer when you're you know plasticky feel to it because this is plastic basically so um, you kind of want to have that kind of built in that stretch in it a little bit, not too much. Cause then it, um, it generally speaking, if it gets real stretchy, then that means it won't hold shape. So you want it to be a little bit flexible, but not one way that you can tell if the, the, it's been, uh, conditioned up appropriately is if you roll it out, um, and it's also helpful to have a pasta maker, but you don't necessarily have to have that. You know, a roller is a really helpful tool. I don't know where it is in this house, so we're just not going to think about it. But um, anyway, so when you roll it out, if there are a bunch of like cracks and stuff along the edges, then that means that it's probably not conditioned and you need to do that. You need to keep conditioning the clay. Now, when you condition the clay, you're doing a couple of different things. Now, in the ceramic world, they have a process called wedging. Wedging is where you're working the air out of the clay and um, you're getting it ready to be used. If you have a bunch of air bubbles in ceramic clay, you can have some problems where um, things can explode in the kiln or it can cause a bunch of issues where like if it's like structural, it can create a weak spot. So you do not want to have air in the clay. So when you're conditioning, you're also wedging um, your clay. So that helps work out any air bubbles. Um, sometimes when you fold clay over and over, you know, if you've ever made pastry, you can actually lock in air bubbles. It's not the end of the world, but sometimes what happens is those air bubbles will you know, when you heat air up, it expands. So it kind of will puff up like a puff pastry. So unless that's your goal, then we don't want to do that. So um, conditioning the clay also helps work out some of those air bubble issues. All right. So I've got this clay. It's kind of stiff because it's been sitting. But um, 
if you have warm hands, that also helps to condition the clay. It makes it a little bit softer and more pliable. You want to make sure that it's nice and kind of smooth and easily workable. Now, there is a couple different people out there who are super, super duper smart. And they test the clays and all the properties. And they're really good at um, There's the blue bottle tree. Um, Ginger, she is super, super knowledgeable about working with clay and different types of clay to to achieve different um, different qualities and stuff like that. So I definitely recommend her as a place that to go for reliable information. You know, there are some people that are on the on the internet where if you look up something, they've only done it like one time and then they tell you stuff that they've kind of loosely read on somebody's blog or whatever. And sometimes that's not always true. So um, you have to take stuff with a grain of salt. Um, and then sometimes with like presentations, I know I've done this before. I've messed up my words. And sometimes that I've said things that were not, um, you know, in hindsight, when I look back over it, it's not exactly what that does. And I realize that that's kind of like the pressure of being on camera or whatever. But for the most part, you know, you want to, take things with a grain of salt. So what I just did there is kind of like a bootleg way of making coils or long kind of shapes. And then I mix them up and I twist it around. And I just want to do this until the clay doesn't do that. Like it doesn't break so easy. Now this is a stiffer clay because it's got all kinds of stuff. Um, I used a bunch of recycled clay into this. so. I think there's a glitter clay in there um, and the glitter clay is a little bit more, more fragile. And since this is kind of like all the scraps mixed up, um, you do have to keep that in mind. But the hardest part is getting this kind of conditioned into, you know, so that you can work with it. But once you get it conditioned, it's really a, a joy to work with. All right. Now, one of the other things that I've got in my kind of arsenal of tools is aluminum foil. Now, aluminum foil is not going to melt at the temperatures that we're going to be baking our product projects in. So that means that it's ideal. It's really great for armatures and building up uh, volume. Now, there's a couple different reasons why you want to do that. Number one, you, um, unless you're kind of like independently wealthy, you may not want to use a ton of clay, you know, that is relatively inexpensive, comparatively speaking. But, you know, if you have stuff where you don't actually need it, um, you know, you can spend a lot of money if you make this great big sculpture out of clay um, and then you're only seeing the surface of that, you know, that's kind of, you know, you're, you're wasting money that way. Um, number two, keeping the, 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 the weight down. You don't want to necessarily, I, I mean, clay, this clay is light comparatively. However, if you make a great big piece, you don't want it to be like super duper heavy. All right. So just keep that in mind. It keeps the cost down, keeps the weight down. Now, the other thing that it does is that it keeps it relatively um, thin. Now, uh, the reason why that kind of sometimes is important is if you have a great big thick piece, it may not cure all the way. So when you're curing your clay in the oven, you're working, it's, most people think about it as like, like you're cooking food. And it's kind of similar. However, it's different in the sense that the clay, the heat is causing the clay, the chemicals in the clay to kind of harden. So it's a chemical reaction on a, on a very, uh, uh, 
on a small scale and the heat is used as a catalyst. Now, if you don't heat something evenly, so for example, the instructions are you have to heat something 275 for every quarter, um, 15 minutes for every quarter of an inch thickness. So if you have a great big thick piece, you're going to have to cure that longer in the oven for it to um, fully cure. Otherwise, the outside is going to be cured, but the inside is not going to be cured. And when you have like that raw clay with a cooked clay, sometimes that can cause cracks. You know, cracks aren't the end of the world. However, it is an extra step that you're going to have to go through. So if you can keep things relatively um, in the same thickness, then you're going to be a lot better off. Because if you have great big thick pieces, you're going to cook or cure your polymer clay at the, from the thickest point. Now, the issue with that is, is sometimes if you have these little dangly, fiddly little little tendril things coming out, if you, you there's a, a, a greater chance of you burning your clay. Now, if you burn your clay, it's not the end of the world. However... You just have to be mindful of that and tent your things and do it in a way that it's not going to get messed up. All right. So we've talked about thickness of the clay. Um, we can talk about affordability of the clay. And we also talked about, um, what was the second one? We talked about how it's not expensive. Um, I don't know. Um, oh, volume? I don't know. But anyway, so the other thing that we're going to also work on is having a structure. Now, when polymer clay goes into the oven, it gets super duper soft. It may seem weird, but it gets soft before it gets hard. So when you put something in the oven, if you've ever made anything kind of big and you didn't have an armature in it, it will sag over because the clay becomes soft and the weight of the clay was working with gravity will make your, your sculpture kind of slump over. So the way that you kind of get away with that, um, get away from that is you use an armature, which is used in traditional sculpture um, so that you have a form to work on. And then that internal form will help keep it shaped. Um, this can make it stronger. So, um, oh, it was weight. So we are, we're, I highly advocate if you're going to do a bunch of sculptural work to think about how you can incorporate armatures. Now, armatures can be used with wire. It can be used with uh, aluminum foil. Um, generally speaking, if I'm making an armature for a sculpture, I will rough out my shape in wire. It's like the skeleton of your sculpture. So, um, oh, I see we have a couple new people. Facebook user, Cindy's watching. Hey, everyone, I'm not going to touch my phone because I've been touching this clay. Um, but anyways, so the armature will be the skeleton of your structure. So I will, if I'm working on a very complex sculpture, um, I will, and I can also bake in stages too, so keep that in mind also, is I will start off with a wire skeleton and then flesh it out with aluminum foil. Now remember, you can compress and keep this, uh, um, you can compress it down, but it will also increase weight. So you kind of have to walk that middle line of keeping it compressed so that it's not going to fall off but also, or get too massively distorted. But also, if you compress it down real, real tight, it will make it kind of more dense. So if your goal is to have a lighter piece, you don't want to compress this down too much. So you'll notice that this is kind of roughly crumbled, and that there's a reason for that. Now, the other thing is, is um, if you are working with an armature, it's good to have something that's going to have a tooth to it. Now, a tooth is a textured surface which will allow the clay or whatever to stick to it. If you have a super smooth surface, 
like high polished, you can peel it right off. This ceramic tile has a glazed surface. It's super smooth. This will, your clay will pop right off. So if you're, if you have an armature and it's like super high polished smooth, if it doesn't encapsulate it completely, there is a chance that that's going to pop right off and, it's, and then that's that. I mean, that could be interesting. That could be cool. If you're working with hollow forms, maybe that's something to think about. But that's another day and another project and another way of thinking. So we're just going to glaze over that and think about how we're going to add texture to the surface of our armatures so that they can stick. For the most part, we're not going to be using this in the way that you most people think because we're working with bas relief and bas relief is um, where you're taking kind of um, a flat surface and building up it's relatively flat so we're gonna make like a plat so that is something to think about um, so we're not going to be using this in the way that a lot of times people use we're going to use this in kind of a way to build up volume but in a sneaky way all right now the other thing that i've got which is kind of specialized is this eye and it may be too big i have to think about it i have a backup and this is this is small um, i was looking at pictures of albino rabbits today because you know why not um but um the you can embed things into polymer clay and bake them as long as they hold up with temperature. So if you have something made of wax and you put it and you embed that, that wax is going to melt out and that thing will no longer be there. Um, so, and I don't know what that will do. Maybe something funky. Maybe it's a, it's a cool idea to experiment with. I don't know. But um, you, it has to be able to hold up to the temperature in the oven. So um, some things do not do that. Certain plastics will start melting and get funky and start bending and smoking and bubbling and all kinds of stuff. So you kind of have to experiment. Some things you know, like if it's a stone or glass or a ceramic or even metal, you know it's going to hold up. Now, here's the thing. Um, polymer clay may or may not stick to it. Um, so if it's a smooth object, for instance, a bead, if you just stick the bead in like this, if you stick it in like this and you bake it and you're like, I love this, it's going to go like this. And then the urine's not going to be any more. You know, there'll be a nice shiny little dimple of where that was stuck. Um, now, there are ways of getting around that. However, the most important thing you can do is create your sculpture in a way that creates like a lip on top of it to hold it down in place. All right. So that will help hold whatever you stick in in place, that kind of lip. It's kind of like a bezel that you're setting a stone in, except instead of a metal bezel, we're using clay as our bezeling material. So just keep that in mind so that you want to have something that's going to hold it in place. Now, if it pops out, it's not the end of the world. You can always glue it in place. You can do stuff after the fact, but that's what's going to happen. So if you just stick stuff on, there, it's not a question of if it will fall off, it's when it will fall off. And falling off may not be the thing you want to do. All right, so let's move on. So I've got kind of my rough illustration of what I want. I'm gonna look at the forms of this. So I'm gonna orient my, my work surface to match the kind of image that I'm working off of. And so what I've got is kind of like a rectangular shape. So I'm going to work fairly large today. So I've oriented this subway tile in the same way that I have my piece. That's not essential. However, if you're working and the, the tile is horizontal and you're building out your sculpture, 
you may run out of room and then you have to use a tissue blade to scrape it off and gently place it. And it's just one more thing that you don't have to do when you're, when you're trying to do something. All right, so I've got this eye, it's fairly large. I kind of like it, so we may use this, we may not use this, I'm thinking about it. Now, one of the nice things about this is that it's got kind of like a screw back on the back and it's textured, it's ribbed, so that whenever you stick it in, if you bake it in place, that's going to lock on there and that's not gonna come off super easy. So that's one more way. However, if I have a relatively thin uh, plaque back, this may be too, too long. So if that's the case, then we'll need to get our cutters out and trim this. So you can just trim it however long you want it to be. Um, I might be able to get away with this. I don't know if I'm going to use this or not, but I do like it. So I'm going to think about that. Um, I may just use this because then I can make a smaller sculpture. This doesn't have a pupil. Um, in theory, I can add a pupil after if I want, or I can paint the pupil on. There's a lot of different ways that I can add that. Um, so sometimes you have to think about your, your materials in the sense of what the possibility is and not necessarily what is actually there. So by by color, um, this is a great color for the eye. However, it doesn't have a pupil. So if it doesn't matter if you have a pupil, then that's fine. A lot of times in the sculptures I make, I use little black beads um, and um, I, I like it. I mean, it's a nice way. Sometimes doll eyes or uh, taxidermy eyes can get kind of expensive. So this is a way that you can do this relatively inexpensively and still get the effect that, that you want. Now, another perk of using these kind of found materials like this, um, like this um, bead here, is that it will retain its quality up to the temperature that it's baked. Um, and what that means is, is that when the polymer clay bakes, generally speaking, it's going to cure and it's going to be kind of um, flat. It's not going to be super shiny. Um, there are ways of doing that, but that's another finishing technique. And that's not really what we're doing today. So I'm not going to go too far into that. But um, so if you want something to be shiny, like an eye is generally wet, unless you're like me who has dry eyes. But if generally speaking, your eyes are wet and they look glossy. So um, if you use a glass bead for an eye, or if you use a taxidermy, a glass taxidermy eye, then it will look shiny and um, you, you don't have to like um, <laughs> do glazing in that one spot and stuff. It's just one of those little details that makes a, a, um, a sculpture a little bit more based in realism. You can make some really crazy sculptures and dragons and fairies and all kinds of stuff, but those little details that are based in um, that are based in uh, reality help sell your your creature to be a little bit more realistic. Hi, William. Hello, everybody. How was your class today? It was good. We we are trying out a new clay. How was that? It was good. We're going to replace our old clay, our white clay, I think. Is that something she learned at Nsika? Yes. Oh, good. They were, I think so. She was talking to somebody, and she had tried this clay before, and they were in the middle of reformulating it, and she really didn't like it. And then they finally reformulated fully, and we were testing it out today. Oh, good. Yeah. How's everybody doing? Cheryl says, I'm behaving. Look at me. I'm so cool. It's a messy clay. <laughs> oh, I was like, I see that. Yeah. He's wearing a black shirt and there's clay on his shirt. Clay all over my pants. It's very, um. It's like Ghost. <laughs> you remember that movie? Patrick Swayze, Demi Moore. They go have the times with the clay. The times. 
um, she making her super suggestive. Anyway, so see, look what happens when he comes. I'm over here like drill sergeant, teacher time, and then William comes, and then it's comedy hour. <laughs> okay, what you doing? making bunnies. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> And they're like, ooh, vote of confidence up in here. All right. So, anyway, let's get down to it so we're not here for all eternity. Maybe um, some food, maybe stir fry or something. How's that sound? We have soup left over. Is there enough? I think so. If you um, maybe want to get biscuits or something. Oh, yeah, I can do that. Or if you want to leave or not, I don't know. Yeah, I'll go. Okay, bye, everybody. All right, I'll be back. <laughs> Um, all right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my clay and ball it up and kind of work it into a, a rough round shape, all right, like so. I'm going to kind of, since I'm going to be focusing on this head right now, actually, I may do a shoulder. Let me do the shoulder first. So this is twice as large, but I'm not going to make it as thick as um the other one now another thing that you can do if you're only going to work in a part of your piece you can take a sharpie and draw on okay first of all if you're going to draw on with a sharpie make sure you wash this with um dawn dish detergent and give it a little bit of a scrub and then draw on your square or whatever you're doing and then do that. If you work this with clay first, this clay has a residue that will stick to the surface of the tile, and then that residue will be transferred to your Sharpie, and then your Sharpie may not work very well. So just keep that in mind, because if you like, like to keep your markers nice, then that's how you do that. If you don't care, then do whatever. But, um, if you're going to do that, you kind of draw out. And then whenever you're done, you can just wash it off and it's fine. But I don't really need that, so I'm not going to do it. So what I'm going to do is I know that this is going to be thinner because it's in the background. And this is going to be thicker because it's volumetrically going to stick out. But I do know that this is a larger kind of surface. So this ball is going to be kind of bigger than this ball but so let's let me lay this out for you all so that you can see this and then it may make sense it may not make sense let me see if i can i'm gonna exaggerate the ears a bit and you're gonna be like what in the hey hey is he doing um so Let me see. Right. So this is going to be our rabbit. So you have a larger ball here. You have kind of this medium shaped ball here. And you have these two kind of log shapes here. All right. And you'll be like, that looks like hot trash. Well, we're not done yet. All right. I've got my extra here because I do add stuff. And this is also kind of like where I will put whatever clay that I'm not using. I'll scrape it off and put it in there. Um, one thing I will use, um, and it is more specialized, is this kind of dental tool. You don't necessarily need this. If you don't have this, you can get use like a butter knife or whatever. But this is used so that I can have clean lines when I'm doing that. And also, it is sharper. Like, that tip is fairly sharp. So that means I can incise lines pretty good. Um, so just keep that in mind. All right? So the first thing is, this is going to be in the background. This is going to be in the foreground. And these are, or wait, background, midground, foreground. This one is kind of on the same level as this. So you just kind of have to keep that in mind about that. All right? Because this is behind this one. So you're thinking about this in layers, right? 
So I've got this ball. I'm going to kind of um, push it a little bit, get some of that air out. And then I'm going to slightly kind of go start from the center, working outward. I'm going to create the, the flatness of the shape, right? This is kind of like when you're working pizza dough, you're getting that like that. If you have a roller, you can roll this out. Um, that's one way of doing it. Smash it down, roll it out. You can also put this in the pasta roller and cut the shape out. However, this is how I'm going to show you how to do that. So I have that ball. I flattened it out. If I see any hairs or anything like that, I'm going to pick that out while I go. See that hair? That cat hair? I'm going to pick that out as I go. If there is little hairs and stuff, it's not the end of the world. However, those can create air pockets. There's an air, there's a hair there. I have cats, y'all, so that, that's what happens. This is not from the top of my head, promise you. All right, I get it. I got it mostly. Anyway, so you don't want a bunch of hairs in here. And the reason why is that um, it can cause air pockets and it can cause, um, you know, we're going to be painting these. So it's not the end of the world. However, it may not be the thing that you want to put in there. Also, um, you know, if it's got a hair in there, it can potentially cause weak spots and different things like that. So as long as you see it, pull it out when you're going and you should be fine. If a little bit of stuff gets trapped in, that's fine, whatever. All right. So I'm looking at the shape and it's going to be kind of like this, where this is a shoulder and this is going to be kind of the body. I'm going to put that down. All right. Now, this is something that we're not necessarily going to be like committed for all time to. So just keep that in mind as well. Now, you may be wondering why I'm moving up to this right now. Um, and that's because this is going, we're working in a way that's going to be give the illusion of depth of a 3D situation in a mostly 2D, kind of 2.5D. So you're going to be working with illusion in the same way that you're working with painting but you're also using it in a kind of a sculptural way, all right? So this is going to be the back here. I've also kind of given myself a little bit of extra, and that's going to tack on to that. And I'm not going to place that just yet, but I am going to take this and press this down. You can also roll it. Now, when if you've never rolled a ball, Place it in the middle of your hand and use the concave part of your hand to help form it. Now, if your hands are super rough, you know, you can wear gloves or something. Um, it's not necessarily essential, but it is something where anything that's like in your, your fingers, it's going to like telegraph to your piece, which is not super bad. And when I say telegraph, it means that, like, if I have a texture here, it's going to end up on here. So, you know, you have to kind of think about that. Since we are painting our sculptures, it doesn't necessarily matter. Since we're going to add texture, it doesn't necessarily matter. So there's that. I mean, there's people who, when they work, they work like a hermetically sealed area. And, you know, it's like a scientific lab up in there. Um, me, not so much. So this is kind of like the rough and ready organic way of doing it. So I've got this. I'm going to smash this down using my thumbs to work in the, the middle and get that kind of blocked out into the shape that I want it to be. All right. This is kind of the shape. There's a little bit extra for the eye up here. And then there's going to be that. And that's going to look kind of like that. Now, um, what I'm going to do um, is this is this shape's going to get distorted. So it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, is I'm going to kind of place this on here like so. 
You know, if you have this the same size, if you have these at the same size, in theory, you can lay this down and then kind of match it up exactly. And you could do it that way. I'm not going to do that. Now, if you do decide to do that, if you're going to do that, either laminate this, get this laminated, or put a thin film of plastic, like a wet media acetate, or like, you know how they have those overhead projectors and they have those like clear film. The reason why is this paper is porous and it will leach out the, the, um, the liquid inside of this, the plasticizer, it will leach it out. Sometimes if you have clay and it's too mushy and it's too like wet, you can put it on a piece of paper and it will suck out some of that moisture and make it into a little bit of a stiffer body clay. So that's something that you can do. Now, um, so if you're going to do that and you have this like a one-to-one -one ratio that's the same, put, uh, you know, either laminate this or have a plastic something, put this on top and you can actually measure it out perfectly. And you can even trim it and do all kinds of stuff. This is kind of more of a gestural approach. Um, and then I've got this, the shoulders coming off and I've got the ear kind of in the background. I'm going to press it down firmly. Now, if we were using ceramic, you would want to score and slip. Um, because we're not using ceramics, we are, you know, it's, it will, it's better if you do that. And what I mean by score and slip is you take like an incisor and you make some marks like this. And then you can put some liquid clay in there and do that. However, you don't necessarily have to do that. Um, but what we will do is that we'll flip it over and you can use your popsicle stick to kind of blend this into it. And that's just gonna make a better bond. I mean, it's not, the thing is you don't wanna work on this and then you spend all this time on it to work on it. And then, um, you, then when it comes out of the oven, then it breaks off. So you, you do wanna kind of spend a little bit of time doing this and you'll just blend these seams down and they look real rough right now and that's okay. And wherever there is like the, you're just blending those seams in so that you're transitioning this instead of being three separate pieces of clay, it's gonna be one piece of clay, one clay. All right, so there's that. If you end up with any little boogers, pick those boogers up and put them onto that kind of reservoir, all right? I'm going to roughly shape this out for the front ear um, in the, the foreground ear. And notice I'm not spending too much time because I know that by the time I do all this, it's going to change. Now, part of this, what you're gonna have a problem with is if you just stick it on like so, looks good, huh? When you look at it from this angle, let me put that there so it doesn't fall down the mountainside. When you look at it this way, it's got this void here. So if you want this to stick up, you have to brace that with um, aluminum foil or something else because when this gets hot, this clay will and get sad and fall down. Um, for me, since we're doing this in kind of a, a way, we're going to actually press this down and um, we'll just press this flatter. All right. So we're going to smooth this down and marry that um, into the clay. And then we're going to kind of look at it. We're going to roughly form it. So if the ear is kind of like an L, just look at that. We're going to go and kind of trace this line and trace this line with our eyes moving down. So we know that there's a little bit of a slope. So we're going to do that. And we're going to just kind of, this is more blunt. So we're going to keep that being a little bit more blunt. And we're going to have it like so. All right. 
Now this is a little bit, there's a indent. So I'm going to use a finger and press this indent in. Now, if I want this to really pop up, I can also take another piece of clay and manipulate this clay so that it's kind of roughly the same shape. And um, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna put this in here like this. Now, if you don't wanna put a lot of clay, another thing that you can do is you can take this aluminum foil and tear off a piece, a small piece, form it into a shape. And this is, you can get pretty precise detail with this aluminum foil. Most people don't really th think that. They think of aluminum foil as being just like flat. But because it's so thin, you can have that. And you can embed this in the clay and then put clay on top. And you're, I'm pressing this out into kind of like a little shape, uh, a thin flat shape. And then I'm gonna cover up this um, uh, aluminum foil. And that way the piece is not gonna be super thick um, when we're, we're going down to it. Now, there's things that we have to be mindful of. When we do this, um, there's aluminum foil underneath, and it will always be underneath now. So that means if I scrape away and remove a lot of clay, if I'm not mindful, I can hit that clay or that aluminum foil. Um, so you do want to press firmly. That Make sure that it kind of gets in all the nooks and crannies. But see also here how it kind of pops through. that is something that can happen. So you just have to add some clay in an additive manner and get that done like so. So make that into a ball. Gen whenever I'm patching a hole, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll work this clay a lot and condition a lot with my finger. I'm just pinching the heck out of it. You know, you think of them cute babies or um, something that you want to pinch, them cheeks. And you just pinch it and pinch it and pinch it. And what this does is it makes us nice and soft and kind of extra pliable. You can actually make it really gooey. I've mixed this clay a lot, so it's not going to be as gooey as if it's just out of, fresh out of the package. But then when you get in there, you can put it in there and you can almost smear it on. And that's going to help cover and patch those, those holes. All right, so I know that I'm gonna need an eye hole. And the eye, I'm gonna use this one. I was gonna make a great big sculpture, but I don't think I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna use this bead. And this, these are some kind of stone, I think. Maybe glass, looks like a stone. So there, you know, I'm gonna be baking this stone, so, um, it could be a lot, you know, some different things happening. Now, what I can do is when I'm making a recess for the hole, I can do this in two ways. I can take my finger, my small finger, and push this in and do it like that. I can also take this popsicle stick, insert it like so, and then twist it. And that makes an instant hole. Sometimes you pull up some clay, so just keep that in mind. Um, but you can also press, but sometimes it messes up over here where it kind of moves the clay. So you press this in. I'm putting the holes off to the side, right? There, this is a bead, so there's holes in it. So I place this so that the holes are not in the front. I've seen some really beautiful Turkish pieces where they put the beads in and they're setting beads, but then they put the holes in there and you know that it's a bead that they set and not a capuchon, which I mean, it's fine, whatever. All right. If you remember what I talked about earlier, your um, piece needs to be secured in place. So we need to put um, an eyelid on here which will be our clay bezel, which holds our 
um, added component in place. This is sticking up pretty high still. So I'm going to press this in pretty aggressively and it's going to, I'm going to work that clay around it and make it nice and, and pushed in like so. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of coil of this clay and I'm going to pinch the edges down and roll it out so it makes this kind of like turd shape. And then I'm going to put this on here like so and put that like that, all right? Now, whenever I'm adding clay, I want to smooth down my seams. So I'm going to go in there and I'm going to just gently press the seams down. I'm not going to do the inner seam. And one of the reasons why is if I do that and smash that down, you're going to remove the definition between your embedded bead and your um, clay. And I want to keep that to look kind of like um, you. I I want it to look um, like I want that delineation between the the other surfaces. Now I'm pop, I'm working with a popsicle stick. I'm not getting the best texture, um, but that's okay because I'm going to. I don't really. I'm gonna. You know. I can go back over that later. But I do, I would recommend if you are going to do a lot of fine sculpting work to spend time either making your tools or um, purchasing nice um, ones that you can kind of augment. So there are some plastic ones that you can get um, that have a nice kind of smooth surface. Um, now, one thing that I will say is that this is a good technique to, or a good exercise that you can do to get yourself more familiarized with your tools and roll this out into like a shape or whatever, um, a flat-ish surface and use it in different ways. So this is like a dragging. You can stipple it. You can turn it on its side. And when you examine those marks, they have different qualities to them, right? So this, okay, so I did drag, I did stab, and then I turned it on its side. So I'm going to erase that. I'm going to pick up this metal tool. So I did a drag. I did a stab. And then I turned it on its side, and then I did a press. So you can see there's a difference between the drag, the stab, and then the turn on the side. See the differences? Now, with this just scrub obscure, we're going to do drag, Stabbed. There's no raw side, so maybe we'll go up and down. So we've got some different. Uh, so this would be more like this. This would be the stab. And this is turn it on its side. So um, play around with that because you can see that if you do in consecutive you're going to get this kind of texture like that. Also, if you do this, you're going to get that texture. So it's all about experimenting and trying out kind of, you know, using your tools and getting to know what the shapes, what will happen if you do certain things. This, you can file this down. You can cut little wedges in and make a scale pattern. You can kind of create a reverse scale pattern doing stuff like this. So it's a way of working. You know, you're using these are your for your texture for you to build up the richnesses of the surface surfaces. All right. So I've got this. I'm pressing this down and I'm going to make a little another little shape here. Another little turd shape 
roll it out onto a coil, get those little ends down, make them thinner, and then um, I'm gonna attach the um, the under eyelid. Now it looks a little bit not right right now, but I'm going to work this down. As you can see in the illustration, it's kind of gotten an um, it's kind of got it's not perfectly round. So you have where the tear duct is. So you can kind of um, plan that into your your build also. So I'm going to take the back end of the shish kebab skewer and use that because that's a little bit smaller than there. All right. So I've got this roughed out like so. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of look at my sculpture or my illustration and um, look at where I need to build up the volume. So the volume is in this cheek. I can, one of the things I can do is I can make a ball of aluminum foil and embed that. Um, I'm kind of happy where it is now, but I do want to make this ear a little bit more... Um, I want this ear to be have that kind of the same kind of thin ridge kind of look. Now, because I am working with illusion, um, and this is really thick, this is much thicker than the ear would be. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pinch along the sides of this. I got a hair stuck in there. It's probably one of my eyebrow hairs. All right, I'm going to pinch this up. I just put it back in. I pulled it out, and then I put it back in. All right. All right, I'm going to pinch this, and it's going to thin out the clay a little bit, but it's also going to give the illusion that this is a much thinner shape than it is. Now, if the clay is popping through, or the aluminum foil is popping through, I can take the back of this tool here and press that in, and then I can make a little ball and put that in there, and then smooth it shut. Now there may be air bubbles, so I'm, I'm playing with fire, y'all, but not too bad. Um, so I'm just thinning this out and getting that shape, kind of that ear shape, in there. So what I'm also doing is I'm bracing underneath this finger and I'm pressing with this one. So I'm getting force from both sides and it's creating the, that kind of shell-like of the ear. All right. So over the head or the eye is this kind of like little lump. So I'm gonna take this little bit of clay I'm going to shape this out to be a little bit more um, of a, like right there. And then I can use my tool to help me um, smooth that in if I need to. And then that's going to help create that. I'm going to use this. I wasn't going to use this for sculpting, but um, I'm going to use this because it's a little bit... It's a shorter thing. Okay, another thing we should talk about if you're making tools or using unconventional tools is how they fit in your hand. This is a little bit long, so this is not necessarily ideal because you can actually poke your eye out if you're not being careful. I probably won't because I have the screen in the way, the phone's in the way, but um, you know, if you're not paying attention, you can have problems. But again, if you smooth this out, my favorite sculpting tool is an African porcupine quill. Um, and I like that probably the best of all the sculpting tools. All right, so I'm working on blending this clay in and getting that nice in there. I've over-exaggerated the eyelid a little bit. And I've over-exaggerated the ears a little bit. And that way you can tell right away that it is what it is, but it's a rabbit. So I'm gonna actually thin this clay out just a little bit. 
Um, and that is going to um, give the illusion of depth a little bit more. And then one of the things I'm going to do is make sure that this is blended with this larger piece because we want this to be connected. We don't want it to be hanging out in outer space. And then when it comes down to it, I'm going to take my fine point. I'm going to put a, a I was going to say something else, but I was, I'm going to put a lot of texture in this recessed area. And one of the reasons why is when you have a texture and it's, um, if you have a deep texture, what's going to happen is, what's going to happen? I can't ask you all because, well, I guess I could. Um, when you put a deep texture and you paint on that and you do like a wipe away technique, what's going to happen is all of in those textured areas, the deep texture, it's going to be darker than if you do a real shallow texture. If you do a real shallow texture, there's not enough of those crevices to hold the paint. So if you have real deep texture in that area, um, it's gonna be darker. So I'm thinking of like shadows, right? So this is, if we've got our shape right here, and this is, we want it to be, um, to if we were painting this, this there would be a shadow. There's a shadow line around here. It's just, you can't really tell it, but it's a little bit a gray shadow right here. And that's gonna show that there's an illusion of depth, right? So I'm gonna build up Some of these, um, some of the things that we're going to do is we're going to look at where there's in incised shapes, so um, like holes. So one of the things we can do is for like this eye and the tear duct, you can stab that in there and kind of pull it down if you want to have like an increased kind of depth of this. And then you're going to take this, we're going to find this, going to hold it, make the hole for the nose hole. I am making this kind of deep. And then I'm gonna turn this on the sides like this. And I'm gonna make that kind of cleft. And you can't really see it very well. I'll turn it up on the side here. By making this cleft here, because that's how the nose goes, they've got this kind of like the nostril hole here, and then there's a cleft. And then there's going to be like this, their mouth opens down here, like so. If you want to take and make right now, take a small flap of clay, like so, roll it up into a little ball like this, and then per squeeze it out like so. So you've got this kind of like petal shape. See this? Don't look like much, but that's like a little petal shape. And you can put this in here and blend this down. And then when you're eventually working, you know, you wanna get that um, blended in a lot of space. It creates kind of a lip. And then when we add on top and fluff out that cheek, it's gonna create the illusion of um a lip from the side so that like the mouth it'll look like more like a mouth all right so i can see that there's kind of an indentation here so i'm going to work that in there and then i see there's kind of a flare out and bulge here so i want that flare out and bulge so i'm going to take this clay i'm going to work it till it's nice and kind of soft and conditioned And then I'm going to smash it into a ball and then uh, or smash it into like a, I don't know what shape that is, like saucer? I don't know. Empanada? No. Something that's thick in the middle and thin on the sides, like that. Kind of like a blister pearl. If we were using traditional um, sculpting techniques, we would score this put a little bit of slip in there. You take this and you'd rotate it until it grips. It's not really a, 
it's a disc, but it's like a fat in the middle and thin on the on the edges. And then you take that and then you use your fingertip to blend the transitions in, right? Now, if your fingers are too big, you can use different tools to get into them nooks and crannies. All right. And this is kind of too high, so I can use my other fingers and press this down so that it has like this shape. And, um, all right. And then it kind of blends into this. So we're going to do that. All right. So looking at this, I've got this kind of flare out of the fur here. I've got the cheek here. This kind of blends in here like this. And I'm going to work this in there so that it's nice and blended. All right. I've got this. I'm going to smooth this down just a little bit so it's not quite as, a, as aggressive as I thought I wanted it originally. And then we'll have it like this. Marion says lentil. Yeah, that's it. Lentil. All right. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this sculpture because it's just a demo. Um, but right now, you know, if you're happy with this, you could be happy with this and be done. But I think the most fun part is adding the texture. So, again, we kind of have to think about our forms. So, if you look at, like, Assyrian artwork, um, um and kind of Near Eastern uh, artwork, there's like the um, the Ishtar Gate and some of the other like Babylonian style, but more Assyrian artwork. If you look up their relief statues, they're high, like especially their animals, they're highly muscled. That the musculature is very apparent, almost like ev everybody's on steroids. Um, and that's kind of neat um, because it, it shows that there's a lot of like visual considerations. So what we're going to do, we're not going to go completely jacked up rabbit style, but we are going to create kind of the idea of musculature. So I don't know because I can't see the rest of this image, but I'm imagining that this is the shoulder and this, this is the arm, and there's kind of like a bump out for the breastbone. So I'm going to build this into the shape. And I'm not going to be too careful. Because um, I'm just not. Um, because we're going to end up texturing it. But this is kind of like an arm. So I'm going to put this arm in here. And I want this breastbone to um, protrude a little bit. So I'm going to add a little bit, a little worm there, and add some more of this. And then I know there's going to be like a hump in the back for some fluffy goodness, like the spinal ridge. So I'm going to put that kind of like here. And I'm going to add a little bit more to bulk up this arm just a little bit. Maybe our, our, our rabbit did work out a little bit. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, right here, I notice there's kind of like a little flare out. And so I'm going to add just a little ball right here and puff that out just a wee bit. Um, don't want that little booger to go in the nose. And then I'm gonna look some more. And maybe this needs to be a little bit more flared out, I feel. Otherwise, it looks like it one of them celebrities that got their jaw done. All right, so wherever I've added clay, I'm gonna smooth that down and marry the blend those edges because if you don't then you're going to end up it's going to look real veiny and that may not be the look all right and also it may pop off so i'm just using my fingers to blend down and smooth out the clay so that we can have um that and then i always think it's good to have this kind of references materials around you 
so that you can always look at them even if you don't have like if you're working with a fantasy creature sometimes it's good to have different like points of reference like if you're making a mermaid um look at like a person for the up and then look at like a fish for the down below or if you have like a reverse mermaid the other way you know having a reference guide will definitely help you create more realistic creatures even if they are fantasy and complete whimsical those little pops of detail will help sell it as um something that is real like you know exists now if you work in a much more like um more um whimsical style like where it's more like shapes um this this sculpting method may not be you know the thing that you use in your work however you can still take away certain things and utilize certain techniques that we've done um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here and use that and smooth down the edges a little bit. And then what I'm going to do, I think we're going to get close to texture time. And then we're going to start adding texture. Because this also, because we, okay, so when you look at a clay, I'm going to smooth this out. When you create a texture, you're also sculpting with that texture, right? So you can you can trick the eye into um, flowing around your object. And you, using certain textures, you can move the eye around your piece, all right? So another person who I'd recommend looking out is looking at if you like this kind of technique, who's far more skilled than I am, is Beth Carver. Beth Carver. Um, I think that's her name. And um, she does these beautifully sculpted pieces where they're very much of the clay, but also shows uh, that kind of um, that nod towards realism but also she'll do things like a minotaur or things like that um and you can get you know they're very sensuous and that their surface detail is really very kind of luscious in that way all right so what i'm doing right now is i'm just blending down all of the edges making sure that they're nice and smoothish and i'm going to also every once in a while it's good because this is on a tile to pick this up and look at it from different angles and what you can see is if you're not looking at that angle some things there may be places where there are creases and lines that you don't see um, if you don't pick it up and like you can see certain cracks and different things like that. Like over here on this side, there's a great big piece that I need to smooth down. And um, there you go. All right. Now, if I wanted to build out the body, in theory, I could. But I'm just doing like a bust or the, the head of it. All right. So when we're building and adding our texture, we don't want to go over the texture that we're using. So I'm going to show you how to hold stuff. And you may, may be well aware of this already. So there's a lot of different ways that you can do stuff. But generally speaking, your hand is a tool. So I have this one, my pinky, and my uh, the, the meat of the palm of my hand will be flat on the surface this is the surface touches this and if i need extra i can take this and put this like so and i'm holding it with my middle finger and my thumb and i'm also bracing up in the air um with um my pointer finger so it's like this 
the reason why is if you hold like this, this nib, it, it can like wobble, wobble, wobble. But if you hold like this, you're getting much more pre precise. Now, sometimes you don't have the room or you can't do that or you don't want to touch the sculpture, um, in which case they have things where you can like elevate your hand and stuff like that. But what we're going to do is I'm going to hold it like this. I hold it where I'm almost writing sometimes. And I can use this to hold this nice and firm. Um, or I can use a hand. But I want to have it where it's braced. However I'm holding it, I want this to be braced. So this is kind of like the, the fur that I'm going to go. Like, if you look at this, the, there's like a strong line of fur going like this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to rough out that first. And then I've got the fur here. And then this is kind of like a nimbus. And I'm not being super precise. And this is just kind of like my map. What I'm doing right now is I'm creating my map of textures. I want there to be kind of a delineation here. So I'm going to put this like this. And what I'm doing is I'm basically sketching out how I'm going to apply more considered texture in a minute. So there's kind of a weirdness here. So I want this to get kind of smoothed out. And then I've got this texture over here. Okay. Now you're gonna end up with a lot of boogers. Um, and generally speaking, I just kind of brush those aside. And then when I have a bunch, I can kind of pick them up like that. All right. So we're just kind of building in that texture. Since this is on the tile, I can move the tile so I can go all the way around the piece. And then I can create, see the texture from every angle. And I'm just kind of loosely doing that. Now, I'm not getting super precise right now because what right now I'm kind of looking at this picture. Like this looks like it's going off this way. I may not want it like that. I may want it more like this. And if that's the case, I can use my finger to kind of smooth this down and get that texture back in place. So that it looks a little bit like I'm, I'm going with the form of my sculpture. All right, so I'm gonna look in here. I'm gonna get this, get that on there. I've got kind of a texture where they're going outwards at an angle like this. And remember, I've got kind of a deep texture in here because I want that to be recessed. I want that texture, a lot of texture in there so that really grips the paint later. Um, that does make little boogers, but the boogers, you know, here's the other thing. Once we fire this, we can take a soft kind of, you know, if you wear some denim jeans and um, they get real kind of soft, but then they get like holes and you can't wear them anymore. You can cut those up and then the um, the softness of the denim will, once this is fired and cured in the oven, not really fired because there isn't fire necessarily, but once you have that, then you can take that soft piece of work and denim and you can lightly brush the surface and all those boogers will fall off. Um, Cause sometimes it's kind of like, they can be sharp or whatever and you can get where there, there is issues, all right? And here, uh, the ear is kind of smooth. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a light texture in here, like so. And then wherever there's like a, a darker, I'm gonna put a little bit more texture in there to kind of have that recess but then if I want, I'll just smooth it out a little bit. And then that way, um, you're still getting some of the texture. Now, if you get 
if you get some of the aluminum foil show through, um, that's okay because we're gonna paint this. Now with this, you can pull this around and we can push this a little bit more. So it's more of a, and then flare it out a little bit. So that when we're looking at it like so, it looks like you just have that ear. So this is kind of an undercut. And if you want, you can pick this up. If you've got everything secured down, you can pick it up and work from the back like this. I would also texture this a lot because um, it's going to hold the paint with the texture. So it kind of looks rough, but it's also going to be where we have um, it's um, it's going to be rough, but it's going to be painted. And that's not the part that you're going to see right away. Um, but if you do have it like on a wall or you have it somewhere low, whatever, then you're going to have to consider that. Now, something that I didn't talk about is how to hang this. So we've got a couple different options. Um, you can embed stuff into the surface of your, or into the background of your piece. So for instance, they're, they sell different hanging devices for like picture frames and stuff like that. And you can embed that into the back of your piece um, when you're starting to build your construction and then it's there. You can also pry this up and put something to hang in there like that. Um, I don't necessarily want to pry this up because if I pry this up, then I can I have a chance of distorting it. So what I'm probably going to do later is maybe drill a hole and then, I don't know, I may drill a hole and then insert something with a little bit of glue. Um, I'll think about it while I'm doing this. So I'm gonna consider the surface around the eye. I wanna be kind of gentle, because if I really stab into it, I can really mess this up. And if I do mess up, it's not the end of the world because I can always smooth it over, add more clay or go back over or whatever. And then I'm gonna kind of follow the contours of my sculpture. You know, I'm considering the how it is in real life, but I'm also considering this as a sculpture. I'm never gonna make a rabbit that looks exactly like a rabbit. Um, with a clay, it's all about kind of creating those illusions because, you know, rabbits have soft, fluffy fur, you know, or, or if it's a hair or whatever, then it's got um, H-A-R-E, not H-A-I-R. Um, you know, you're not going to get, um, I at least, I have not seen somebody create the texture of fur like um, it's just, it's an illusion. It's not, it's not, you're not actually duplicating the surface of like a soft texture like that. So what I'm doing now is I'm creating these, these lines and these inside lines are what's going to grip the um, the paint and that's going to create the illusion of fur and the softness of fur but it's not going to you know it's not actually soft so you just have to kind of understand that because sometimes um, you know you, sometimes you can create stuff that's almost exactly the same like um, polymer clay is a really great medium because it is something that you can get a lot of, um, it's a great mimic, it's a mimicker. It can mimic um, a lot of different um, materials and textures and substances, but um, there are limitations. So while you can get it to look like certain thing, you know, getting soft forms is harder. 
All right. Now, when I'm looking at this, there's whiskers. I'm not going to be able to get the whiskers because whiskers are very fine. So I've got to kind of build that into my texture sculpt. I'm actually going to rest this down because I get a better, a deeper line if it's flat instead of me holding this up in the air. And one of the other things I'm going to do is I'm going to take, I've been experimenting with my tools, right? So I know what my tools are capable of, right? So I can take, and I know that there's like these whisker indentations. So wherever there's a face, I can then go and add different, like that stipple texture. And it's going to do a nod towards that realism. And, um, you know, like I said, it's not exact. It's not exact, but it kind of has that, it has that vibe. So, you know, when we're sculpting, we're working with illusions and vibes, and we're working with form language so that they're recognizable. Um, so when you're sculpting, you know, you have to think about what is going to communicate that, what you're trying to say from a distance. So, like I said, when we've got the form language, we're, you know it's kind of a bunny because it's got those bunny ears. You know that it's going to be kind of like an albino one because it's kind of got that pink eye. So I'm just going to go back through and add a little bit more texture. I'm also sculpting the surface of this. If you didn't see, I'm sculpting the surface of this. So um, wherever I can kind of push the tool in and then it's gonna create those kind of musculatures within the, within the um, surface of the clay. I'm moving the clay as I'm adding this texture. So there you go. All right, so I've got a little bit more work to do on this texture, but I'm almost, I'm getting to the point where I'm pretty happy with it. This is kind of a rough and ready. I mean, I could spend hours and hours doing this, but I'm not going to do that to you. All. Um, there are other tools out there um, that they have available there in the pottery world they have this thing that looks like a bristle brush and um, people can use that to create the idea of texture um, you do have to play around with it i mean it is something that it's a little bit because of these are wires you know, it's going to create a different texture. So what I'm going to do, I wasn't going to show you this because it's not, you know, it is a specialized tool. And I was going to try to focus on tools that you might have at home or that you can make. But if you wanted to make that, you could kind of make your own by putting a bunch of um, wires together, some steel wires or do a steel brush and then do that. That makes a really rough surface and you get a lot of pills that way. Like those little, little things popping up. And you will have to kind of brush those off either while the clay is wet or while it's, um, you know, when it dries, like I said, you can just lightly br brush, uh, rub it down with um, the uh, soft cloth. All right, so we're just gonna continue adding some more texture to this piece. I've got some more, I'm, notice I'm not, I am overlapping my texture, but I'm trying not to touch, like with my finger, once I put the texture down, I don't want, I'm using this back one to kind of use as like a sensor so that I don't go over and start pressing on it with my fingertips. Because then if I do that, then I'm just going to take away all that, that texture that I worked so hard to add. Um, 
And then I'm just going to keep doing this until it's done. All right. So um, we're getting to the point where we've crossed the two hour mark of this video. I want to say thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I really appreciate it. I know there's a lot of choices out there of ways of spending your time. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who make videos and stuff and do lives. And we are fully aware of that. And we know that you could easily watch all those other people out there. Um, so we do definitely appreciate all of you who have taken time and have chosen us to spend your time with because, you know, we know there's a lot of options. Susan says, I really enjoyed watching you. Thank you. So I'm just going to keep working as we are kind of winding down um, for our video today. Um, I would really love if people could share something that they're thankful for or that they're grateful for or something good that's happening in their life right now. Um, I really love it when, um, you know, when I'm working, I generally have an audio book on um, and I can focus on that. Um, when I'm working, I try my very best to um, uh, listen to things and feel good about the things I'm doing. I feel like it really helps me create and I like to create good things. So I try to focus on good things while I'm making. I feel like it imbues the pieces that I'm working with, with that energy. And so, um, oh, um, William's mom said, enjoy seeing this. Oh, good. Um, Cheryl said, excited to see the finished projects. It's very calming to watch you create. Oh, thanks. I think. I know it's not SAS Factor 5, which y'all are mostly used to. Um, but, I mean, you can be sassy while you do this if you want to be. I'll just go call William up and get more sassy when he's here. When I'm by myself, it's, it's not as much. I don't, like, I don't know. I don't feel the urge to clown around as much. Um, all right. So I've worked on the surface. Um, Cindy says, I'm grateful for having my family here with me every day. That's nice. Yeah, I'm super grateful for all of you out there who allow us to keep doing what we're doing. I think about that every day, about how lucky we are to be able to do this because we have people like you out there who believe in us. So that's one thing I'm grateful for. Um, I'm grateful um, that um, I, I don't know if you saw this or not, but I recently won a scholarship to Peters Valley I'm going to be working with Aaron Decker this summer on making um, boxes and keepsakes with enamel. So I'm super excited about that. Um, Aaron Decker is a really talented artist who does a lot of really kind of experimental things um, and creates really interesting surfaces. And um, I was going to see him speak at the ECU symposium um, that was in Greenville, North Carolina. Um, unfortunately, I had to cancel that. And so I'm a little bit disappointed that I didn't get to see him speak there. Um, but um, I am excited that I'm gonna be able to spend like, you know, maybe not like one-on-one -on -one time because it's a class, but um, having some kind of extended class time to spend with him and learn from him and his techniques of how he uses enamel. Um, I feel like even if somebody's work is maybe not exactly the way that I work, um, it's okay because you, there's still something to learn. I think there's something to learn from everybody. Um, really, I do. 
everybody is a wealth of knowledge um, and experiences and everybody has something that they can teach, which I think is really a lovely and beautiful thing to think about. You know, everybody, no matter who it is, how much school or education they've received or um, experience, we can even learn from newborn babies and children and, you know, who are, who are young and haven't had, you know, the world tell them no yet. Um, so, you know, I think that the, everybody has something to share and learn. So sometimes in classes, I know a lot of people are like, why are you taking classes? You already know how to do a lot of stuff. Well, I think the thing that's beautiful is that there's never an end point. I'm always going to want to be a student of life and craft techniques, and I'm never going to stop wanting to learn. And, you know, for a long time, I kind of put that on the back burner for myself. I still learn, love to learn through books and videos and, and different things like that, but I kind of didn't think I was... Um, I didn't think I was like worthy enough to to actually spend time doing my own kind of work, so or learning in classes or taking retreats. I always thought someday maybe, you know, if I win the lotto, I'll do that because sometimes you know cost is a barrier. But then when I got serious about my goal and about learning, one of the things that I learned was you know there are a lot of resources out there to help people and you may not have a lot of money but you can still do these things i know sometimes cost is a barrier um you know i don't have we don't make a ton of money with what we do i think we're lucky in the sense that we're able to do what we do but you know we're not going out and buying maseratis or whatever um you know we we definitely live pretty humbly, but um, with that being said, um, we um, I do feel very lucky to be able to do what I do, but sometimes you don't have, you know, endless disposable income, or if you do, that's a great too. This is not to say, you know, if you do have means that that you're not, you know, some, I don't know, that it's like you're not able to do it or whatever because you, but um, on the, that came out wrong, I guess. But what I'm trying to say is that um, you should always have, you always have options about learning. And um, no matter what your situation is, there are opportunities to learn and grow. For instance, there's a lot of you out there who are watching this who may never, ever do this kind of sculptural work. But maybe through watching this, you picked up something of interest or you enjoyed yourself and had a good time. Um, and I think that's another thing. Um, if you, As long as you have a good time and kind of enjoy yourself, and that is what matters, you know, as long as you're having a good time and you can create together, I think that's very important. So right now what I'm doing is I'm going back through and I'm kind of deepening some of my holes and incising some of those lines so that when I've textured this, what I've done is I've created a lot of, um, I've created, um, I've filled in a lot of like details. I've created a lot of details, but I've also taken some of those away. So what I'm doing right now is I'm cleaning up some of those holes and adding some more texture. And then I think I'm done. How about that? Maybe this area right here. Really good. I'm going to do this. I recognize that little brush. This is William's brush. <laughs> I stole it. That's for my attaching handles brush. That's how he make his score. Yeah. This is how I make the texture. <laughs> All right. So there we go. How'd everybody like it? I think that people liked it. So there's a ton of boogers, y'all. This. <laughs> 
them little pills. So after, like I said, after I fire this, or fire, I'm getting targum pottery. After I cure this in the oven, I'm going to go back over and gently polish off some of those things. I'm going to do that over the trash can because I don't want to have to vacuum all my life long away. Um, also, um, when thinking about surfaces um, and what you're working on, don't work on directly on your wooden table, your fancy heirloom table. That's going to ruin your table up. So what I've got, I've got this tile. This tile is going to help me move this around. As you can see, I can look at this from different angles. I can go back in and adjust things. But also, if you're working on a carpeted surface, um, try not to drop stuff on the floor. <laughs> you know, if you have animals, try not, you know, try to keep aware of where those little nubbins are. Because your little critters could be like, oh, that looks delicious. And then, you know, puking festival. So just keep that in mind. And then, so we're pretty much done. I'm going to put this in the oven. So for firing or curing here, I, I skipped this part and I probably should know. So for curing, it's 275, 15 minutes for every quarter inch thickness. So in theory, I can get the calipers out and I can gently measure this and we can think about this all day. Um, I, you know, I'm kind of a, I'm a cowboy. I'm going to do what I want. Live off on the right. Williams in here. So it's a little bit more expressive You're time. Expressive now. I don't know why I'm trying to impress you with my humor. Uh, mm. Anyway, so. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put this on a flat cookie sheet that I tent with um, with aluminum foil. So I basically make an aluminum foil hat and put this over this piece so it covers it. There's two reasons. One reason so I don't accidentally scorch my clay. Depending on what kind of oven you have, um, if you have a dedicated oven, you can use your dedicated oven. We have a toaster oven that I usually use for polymer clay. Um, that's at the cottage. However, you can use this at home, but when the clay cures, it off gases. So sometimes those off gases, can, that residue will stick to the inside of the oven. We don't want to have that, you know, if you're eating and stuff, you don't necessarily want that. What I will say about this is that polymer clay is not necessarily a new material. Um, it was widely popular and used in the 70s onwards. So that's over 50 years worth of information about studies on how people um, will relate to a material. Some art materials are deadly toxic to people. And some materials are deadly toxic over time, so it's cumulative. Certain oil paints contain heavy metals and minerals that are not necessarily good to have in your skin or to eat or whatever. So you do have to practice some caution and care if you want to live a long, happy life and keep making for a long time. So keep this in mind. It is important. I don't want you to gloss over this. However, with that being said, there is no, st the studies that are available from us and popular home usage does not say that this is, um, that this is detrimental to use an in-home oven um, that you do use for food. Um, what I would say is that by putting the tent over your piece and baking it, not only are you protecting it from getting scorched, but you're also creating um, a surface for any off-gassing to stick to. So if it does off-gas, it'll stick to the inside of the aluminum foil before it sticks to the inside of your oven. Um, if you can use a dedicated oven, um, do that. Um, if you can't, you know, they do recommend using your home oven on a lot of um, like polymer clay instructions. Um, now, 
if you use a toaster oven, not an, and this goes for a regular oven too, not all ovens are created equally. Sometimes the elements are off. Sometimes the thermocouple's off. Sometimes there's, you know, there's all different kinds of things. You can invest in a small oven thermometer. That will give you an equal reading about how hot your oven actually is. Um, we had a workshop and um, Christy Friesen, she came and taught and she's using the ovens and stuff. And the one oven, she was like, you can check it, but you know, sometimes you don't have to really check it sometimes. And the one time that she didn't check the oven, it was, it's for some reason, it went hotter than all the other ovens, even though it was set at exactly the same temperature as all the other ones. And it ended up scorching some of the people's pieces. So if you don't want that to happen, use an oven thermometer and get that in there. You can actually cook these a little bit hotter, sometimes 300, um, and it's not going to adversely affect it. However, um, there is a reason why it's at 275 and not like, you know, 300. Or you have to use... Also, here's the other thing. If you don't use the recipes that I recommend, there's tons of different polymer clays. There's all kinds of curing methods. Use the one that the manufacturer recommends. The reason why is that if you're using something that cures at a lower temperature or a higher temperature and you use my temperature suggestions and it's a different material, it does not mean that it's going to work. It may work, but it may also may not work. So you want to set yourself up for success by using the instructions that are provided by the manufacturer of the clay that you're using. And for the clay that I'm using, it's 275 for every quarter inch thickness. So I'm going to put this in probably 45 minutes to an hour just to make sure that it, it, it gets... Um, thoroughly cured all the way through. Now, one thing that I'm also going to think about is signing my piece. I can initial it off to the side here. I think I'm going to create like a little a smooth spot right here. And then we're just going to do my initials. And then we'll put the date two oh two four. That's kind of looks like that. And then so you've got this. All right. And then so once that's cooled, completely cooled, then we'll start talking about how you can paint your creations. How about that? So maybe tomorrow. We'll, we'll do that if you want to learn how to add that color. All right. I've got a hair stuck in there. Also, if you see anything, like little things that you don't want, um, get rid of it while the clay is still malleable instead of waiting till afterwards. Like if you have something like a piece of, of I don't know, sawdust or something sticking out, then you can get rid of it while you still can. All right. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great night. I hope you enjoyed this. If you missed any part of this, this is available for replay. Um, you can replay it on YouTube and on Facebook. On YouTube, you can just get a little bit more quality because it is streamed in a higher resolution. So if you're interested in that, you can skip over the first 35 minutes or so where we do the talk talk, or you can watch that. Um, but yes, um, find us on YouTube for the replay. That's probably one of the best places to do that. And if you have any questions about this process, you can either save them till tomorrow. Um, I would say send them to info at allegorygallery.com. But the thing is, is that I'm not going to be checking... I mean, William checks the email every day, but I don't really check the email. So if you have any questions, either let me know in the comments um, or 
uh, wait till tomorrow and um, we'll go over different things tomorrow. All right. So thank you so much. Have a great night, everyone. And um, yeah, thank you. See ya.